happy to have Natalia here. Um, Natalia, do you want to give a little bit of background and a brief introduction so people can learn more about you? Sure. Um, first of all, that was the most impressive. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how many breaths you managed to take in that entire presentation. <laughs> so, um, very impressive to go through that much content really quickly. So hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here um, at this rather unusual time. So I'm glad that we have so many folks from across the world joining us for this conversation and that this is of interest to people. So my name is Natalia Martinez Kalina. I am Cuban and Russian by birth. Um, I grew up in Mexico and I've lived in the U.S. for quite some time now. Um, I'm an organizational psychologist by training, so I study the group dynamics and the study of groups of people. I went to school in Boston and New York, and then I moved down to Miami where I currently reside. So I've been living here for about seven years. I, as my day job, I run the expansion of a company called the Cambridge Innovation Center, CIC for short, to Miami in Latin America. We are a innovation district builder, and so we include a bunch of accelerator-like, co-working-like, um, ecosystem building and economic development functions. So it's been really rewarding and I've loved it. And then in my free time, I have founded a variety of organizations and I work very heavily at the intersection of educating women to become angel investors and to bridge some of that gender investment gap. That's fantastic. You've really done so much. Um, and I love that you've been proactive in terms of trying to level the playing field here and really educating, you know, um, women that have also been you know, previously excluded as well. Um, a lot of this has been a, a male dominated field. So to get more women investors, um, they in turn can also invest in more women and you know, get back to the community. So I that resonates uh, heavily with me. So um, how did you start your angel investing journey, though? Um, you know, once you were, you know, you had that focus in psychology and all that, but you wanted to kind of uh, move into the space. How did you do it? And, um, you know, where are you now? Sure. So for me, I think, you know, most of my life was not really engaged with entrepreneurs or most of my professional life, probably until about six years ago or a little bit, um, probably a little bit before that, before I started working for CIC for short, for mm -hmm. sure. I had been kind of in a corporate bubble. I wasn't really focused on anything that was innovation or entrepreneurial driven, um, aside from occasionally being interested in some of those topics. And so I would say my first big milestone was becoming aware and then progressively deeper and deeper aware um, and kind of more excited about the possibility that entrepreneurship has across our community. So I think the, the CIC role definitely further deepened that understanding. So I think it's also nuanced my perspective on entrepreneurship as an economic development tool and on innovation as a tool to solve really large scale global or local sometimes challenges, but really to tackle some of these larger issues. Prior to that, I think I had been thinking about entrepreneurship as either kind of much more by necessity than by choice. And so, you know, something that you do because you have an idea and you're trying to, you know, you're an immigrant and you're trying to put food on your family's table, or you have an idea to improve your family business. And so you launch um, kind of a different version of it. So something that was more born out of necessity than choice and innovation and inspiration. And once I changed some of my mindset around the role and the, and the kind of importance of entrepreneurship, for larger issues, as well as kind of as a societal good and a societal kind of economic impact, I became much more interested in then how do we foment that? So how do we support that? How do we get um, kind of, how do we create environments in which entrepreneurs can thrive? How do we fund them? What are the challenges that they're facing? Um, obviously some of that related. Oh, I think, did we lose Cheryl? Should I keep talking? Do we know? I'm going to keep talking. Okay. Until we get her back. Um, yeah. So I think my, my personal journey was really linked to understanding the value and really respecting the value of entrepreneurship and nuancing my own relationship with that. And then starting to ask the very natural evolution of next questions. So how do I support them? How do I engage with entrepreneurs? What are the disparities that exist across, you know, not, not even gender or ethnicity, but what are the disparities that exist around areas that have a lot of innovation and areas that don't have enough innovation or areas where there's a really heavy kind of connection point between the establishment and innovation startup activity in areas or industries where there isn't. And so it, it just became a really colorful, I felt like I just suddenly added a lot of color to that perspective and it became really interesting to me to get involved from different sides. Awesome. So I'm going to be taking over here. Uh, okay. we'll show, Technical uh, difficulties. We got this. <laughs> it happens. Um, appreciate that uh, intro. 
let's let's kind of dive into due diligence specifically as you evaluate opportunities. Um, do you have your own checklist um, and sort of what tools you use? Um, maybe you can even give specific examples uh, while you do your due diligence opportunities. Sure. Um, so I think, I mean, your checklist was a pretty great primer. So I absolutely encourage people to think about those buckets. Um, what I would kind of add as a point of color to this is that obviously each of us come to the table with our own sets of expertise and our own sets of perspectives. So for me, a really, really big one are teams because it is what I've spent my life studying. So I have a lot of thoughts on how to build and create and motivate intelligent and kind of versatile and adaptive teams. And so I spent a lot of time maybe one would say too much time engaging um, around that part of the due diligence process. So depending, obviously, you know, depending on the stage of the conversation and the comfort level with the entrepreneurs, I, I absolutely want to meet different members of the team. Um, I want to understand more around kind of the hiring process thus far. What are the hiring kind of what's the hiring logic? What's the vision for how kind of this team is supposed to function? And I, I don't mean kind of the boring HR pieces of, you know, like, are you are these people signing a contract? Like, how are these people getting paid? Those are really relevant things as well. But it's more around the what is the philosophy for how you're building this team and what is the philosophy that you're expecting will lead this team through the phases that you are ex that you're expecting so i very often kind of along the projection looking forward timeline i ask a lot of questions around well what team will you need at this stage mm -hmm. okay well let's imagine you're at this stage well what team will you need at that stage and to kind of backtrack into what decisions are you making today that are creating kind of on ramps for that that show foresight for that mm -hmm. happening I want to caveat all of this by saying none of us know the future and none of us can like fully predict everything today or prepare for everything, but it's more around kind of understanding what their mindset is because I think this is such a core part of their of everything basically. Um, I think my other piece and I won't ramble for too long, but my other piece around the diligence element is also kind of digging deep on the market piece. Um, Obviously, there are very different configurations of that, right? So you had mentioned, you know, it can be a smaller market, but it can be really hot at the moment, or it can be a less exciting market, but it has some interesting potentials. I, I work very heavily with startups, for example, in Latin America. And so we come across this issue of market very frequently where you may have an idea that's really relevant in your specific market, but that is not really relevant beyond that because there's already like very large competitors or sizable competitors that have taken over that already have a presence in a neighboring country or in a neighboring region. And so what I'm trying to understand around how people look at their market and the interaction with their product is what kind of, what are the potential, what's the potential room for expansion and flexibility there, right? So you may have a solution that you're imagining for this use, but is that solution applicable in other markets that you haven't discussed? Is there something about that, that if you just, if you fractioned it out and you left the rest where it is because it wasn't gonna work or it isn't gonna work three years from now, what can you savage from that and pivot in a different way for a completely different solution or even a different industry vertical? So I try to kind of think through the market and product fit also in this like, well, what if, like bizarre things happen five years from now, which parts of this are adaptable and which parts of this and adaptable where and to what? Mm -hmm. So a little bit of this forward thinking kind of somewhat brainstorm. Awesome. Hey, Natalia, I'm back. So sorry. Thank you so much, Sandeep, uh, for filling in. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, I don't know what happened. My internet just cut off. But you know what? That's why we have a great team with me. So appreciate that. Um, I guess one of the next questions we um, that we got from the audience so thank you once again everyone for submitting um is more about those key metrics like let's think about very tangible things that people need to look at um and based off of also the industries that you focus on maybe some of those like more particular areas that you know for sure that you need to have before you even make a decision yeah so i think if there is one thing that i can say i'm happy to say a couple more things but if there's one thing that i can say on metrics is that i i I encourage entrepreneurs and I definitely encourage startup um, kind of investors to dig very deeply on what data and what metrics we have around clients. Because uh, very often the data that investors are presented are kind of a couple of data points, right? So we have X client retention or we have X client turnover or we've had you know new clients at X rate over the last handful of you know six months. And those are really useful and that's great. But I think you ideally you want a lot more granularity or as much granularity as possible 
possible, right? So, you know, what are the demographics of the current client usage? Um, you know, what is the client feedback, even if some of that is more qualitative because you're collecting it in a perhaps not qual quantitative way, but ideally if you have quantitative pieces, I don't know, like a net promoter score, I wanna know that. Um, if you have client feedback that you can aggregate into some sort of model, I would love to see that. And if, how are customers behaving? So are they, I understand that they're returning, but are they returning six months from now or are they returning every day? So kind of as much granularity as we can about, as we can measure about client behavior, I, I care very deeply about. So I would say that's a big one. Um, the other one to me really, and again, this is kind of on a client customer piece, but the other one is really understanding the cost, the true cost of client and customer acquisition. Um, Cause, and, and very often I feel like it's, when you have a deeper and more nuanced discussion, you uncover different parts of that equation that either need answers and kind of they can be provided, but they, you know, we need to workshop them a little bit or they haven't quite been thought through. And so I, I want to kind of extra double click on this idea of how much it costs and what are the processes that lead to client retention, retention thus far and what are the processes and or different things that we need to client kind of acquire in the future, because I'm assuming those are different. Um, and my last thought I would say is, is really kind of spending time talking about the valuation. Um, I feel like it's, you know, it's an art as much as it is a science. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, understanding kind of what has led, what, where, where are we on the valuation conversation and how we, how do we get there? Um, and I, I, I know one of the questions later is going to be kind of advice for investors. So I'll save a comment about valuation for that. But I would say that's really big as well. Just really digging in there on what the logic for that was. Awesome. Uh, I feel like your checklist would be in an Excel sheet with like clients, costs, <laughs> you know, evaluation, making sure that everything's set. So, and once again, guys, every single checklist is different. Um, we actually, as one of our presents to you, for those of you who are attending, we're going to give you a summer guide to angel investing. So get excited for that. That will include some of the materials that you've seen presented, which is also the reason why we can't just share it just yet. Um, but wanted to keep that in mind. So for those, um, one of another major question that was asked was what are some of the red flags that, you know, you've seen and, uh, to keep in mind, and maybe you might layer like one of your experiences actually that where maybe you've had in your gut or like in your heart, you're like, mm, this is, this, something's not right. And then something might have happened. I would say all of the flags that come to mind are based on experiences and conversations that I've had. Um, so the first one is, too many investors. So if you're planning to have, you know, if you're in like stage two of your conversation around raising money and you have, you know, 50 people <laughs> on your cap table, like this is going to be problematic, right? Like it's going to be problematic for how we think about kind of making decisions today in terms of the interaction with the board um, or the kind of your board of investors slash building a board. It's going to be complicated in terms of eventual sources, eventual rounds and the kind of the dilution of people as we go. And so just looking at this conversation of how many investors are you seeking and how many investors kind of are what is the right number of investors that you are shooting for? And what is your understanding of that as an entrepreneur? My other kind of same but different is too many founders. So I've definitely had a couple of conversations with people where it's not just that they have a team, which obviously is amazing and one would hope, and that's, that's great, but it's more that they have like six founders. And it's like, okay, th this is a lot of people, like the reins of an organization. And so it doesn't mean that there, are, there always are exceptions to that. There are absolutely kind of incredible companies that are composed of larger groups of kind of founders and leaders, but just having so many like pot hands in the pot or whatever the expression is always gives me a little bit of a, it doesn't, I don't know, it's not a no, but it definitely gives me a pause. Uh, and it has given me a pause in conversations that I've had in the past. The other two things, and these are also like very, and I'll, I'll end with one funny example, but the other two things are kind of, there's always that, there's that fine line between clearly you want entrepreneurs to feel excited and be and believe in their idea and feel like overwhelming passion for it right because that's kind of the only way that this uphill battle is going to succeed but on the other side kind of you ideally you want to be working with people that are open to your opinion and open to others opinions and so um, you know i've had many conversations with entrepreneurs over the years where i ask them if they've double checked their concept if they have spoken kind of to experts in the field if they have sought out to like really poke holes in their idea and the entrepreneurs that have not, I personally, I'm like, the, to me, that is a hard 
pass. So like if you're unable to offer to have flexibility and engage in like true testing of your idea, even if the result is actually this doesn't work, we're not going to work well together. And then my last piece is really kind of we all have blind spots. Um, I think it's natural. We all, and especially when we're working 3000 miles a minute in the entrepreneurial world, world, we clearly have blind spots. If you are not aware that you have blind spots, we're not gonna, this is also gonna be a problem. So the entrepreneur, the, a lot of the, the complications that I see, at least in our client community here at CIC are from blind spots that were not foreseen and that were not paid attention to, whether it is a regulatory obstacle, right? So you did all of these things and then all of a sudden you realize that there is this like, several you know multi-layered regulatory obstacle that you have not foreseen or no one has taken a look at and you're now really slowed down and potentially spend you know months without being able to generate revenue and delayed on x topics that you have or x goals that you believe that you should have been able to achieve because you didn't foresee this and so we all have them but being able to have a conversation about that i think is is a big deal and my very my silly but like tiny example is really just kind of background checking people, right? Like you, someone can seem like a really amazing and reputable person. And then you realize that, I don't know, they have a criminal record in like Rhode Island. And you, like, it doesn't mean that you don't invest in people with criminal records because everyone has a story. And sometimes like, you know, that's, that's a story. You want to have like room for people to be who they are and to have their evolution, but you want to know that so that you're able to have an honest conversation. You know, it says if you were getting married, right? Like we talk about investment, investment being like a marriage, right? Like doesn't mean that you're not going to marry someone who has credit, who has debt, but you want to know that they have debt. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. It definitely is like a marriage. And so just to summarize what you said, it's basically about making sure they don't have too many investors on the cap table, which by the way, for Republic, as an FYI, all investors roll up into one line item. So they can have 5,000 people who believe in their dream, right. but it doesn't make it a mess for founders. So. One of the amazing things about exactly. the vehicle. Exactly. We had, we knew, actually created that in mind because we knew that there are so many people who don't want to, you know, deal with so many investors and too many cooks in the kitchen. Um, so making sure that, you know, there's not too many, too many investors, um, you know, having founders that are really open to feedback and I guess to know what they don't know, right. At the end of the day is really making sure that, you know, they acknowledge their blind spots and they also double check, right. They make sure that whatever they're doing, uh, to work with experts and to just make sure that what they're doing is sound. And I think this kind of leads into, uh, one of the questions actually from the audience right now, which is how does your due diligence change when you don't have much metrics to go off pre product product market fit, right? Especially I think in the angel stage, right? Where you're looking at really, you know, early companies, right? How do you, how do you deal with not having all of those tangibles there? Um, have you seen that or are you mostly playing in a different space? Yeah, I get, no, I completely understand the question. I think it's, you know, it's really about the logic model, right? So I think you, number one, this is like making any decision. So number kind of as a piece of advice for angels in general, I think one of the most important pieces I can say is being very honest, even if like, it's just with yourself in your inside voice, if you don't feel comfortable <laughs> speaking out loud with your risk tolerance, right? Like do not pretend to have a different risk tolerance than the actual risk tolerance that you have, right? Mm -hmm. Don't, if you don't feel comfortable investing in companies where you have, you know, are missing certain pieces of information, don't, don't start there. Don't do that. If you don't feel comfortable kind of investing a certain check size, don't, try to make yourself do that. Like wait until you get there because otherwise you're gonna have a much harder time. The entrepreneurs that are trying to engage with you are gonna have a much harder time. But with that kind of caveat, I think most of this is like almost every decision that we all make for our own businesses, right? We, we launch businesses making kind of various scenarios for the future. So number one, kind of, I definitely, if you don't have, if you only have one scenario, that's our, that's another red flag, right? Like we have to, <laughs> so one of the all ways, the to account, right. That's all the effect. So one of the ways to account for kind of lack of metrics because of like early, early stage and growth is kind of how thoughtfully have we looked at the various different scenarios and how do we assess the probability of some of these scenarios occurring or not what's needed for them to succeed. Right? So if all of the scenarios, you know, if we have kind of four different pathways that we've mapped out and three of them require just like superhuman events taking place. This is, we're not very well positioned, right? We need to like rethink what are the probabilities of this happening because that doesn't quite stack up. And so I think it's having very honest and upfront conversations around what is expected and what is really needed for those expectations to hypothetically occur, the convergence of factors, really being honest and mapping those out um, and ultimately assessing kind of what is your degree of risk 
you know, I know people who feel very comfortable with a very high degree of risk because they're investing in so many different entities that every once in a while they're like, I don't know if this is going to work at all, but I really like this, this person. And I think their idea could be really amazing. I really don't know if it's like has any legs at all, but I'm just going to do it because statistically I feel like I'm fine. Um, that's a very different degree of risk than what someone else would be able to handle. That's absolutely true. And we actually did cover Oh no. I think we lost her. Um, for that in one of our mass classes, mass class one and two. So if you guys are over, which is actually so great, but we want to make sure that, uh, you know, we kind of leave the audience with something more um, just tangible as well. Just so that just any advice of good and great so I think the, okay, I think I heard you in terms of advice. So I would say a couple of things. So the first one, um, I think, especially for kind of early stage investors, to me, the big advice is get involved. I say this to people all the time, especially people who think that they have nothing to contribute because they're thinking about investing in a company that focuses on A, and their experience has been in something else. Um, everyone has a perspective that's worth contributing as, you know, everyone has had a professional journey. Everyone is a consumer. So, you know, like I definitely have spoken to some companies that I have zero expertise in, but I, I am there, I am a hundred percent their target consumer because of a variety of things. And so yeah. I feel very equipped to comment on various things from my <laughs> perspective. So kind of make getting involved, obviously getting involved in a way that works for you and in a way that works for the founder. So, you know, figuring out what that best dynamic is, not just throwing yourself into the, into the pie, um, but getting involved and adding expertise and adding connections. And, and it's not, it's not, it shouldn't just be a check ideally. And so figuring out what that means for you and what that means for a founder. Um, the second piece of kind of just general advice or things not to do, I would say is don't think of angel investing as any other kind of asset management or investment vehicle, right? Like the returns are very different. The statistical, kind of mapping of it is very different and very difficult, very difficult to to compare. So if you're, if you're a person that is going to, you know, make a $10,000 investment and then be like sleeplessly anxious about when the results from this are going to come in, oh no, <laughs> you're going you're gonna to give yourself a heart attack because you're not going to know that answer for a very long time. So it, you have to, it's obviously, you know, angel investing is not philanthropy in any way, shape or form. You are expecting a return, but the statistics and the odds for it add up differently. So you cannot be treating this as, well, I invest in the stock market and this is what happens. Or like, this is what I do with my other funds. And this is what happens. Like, this is not that. So, so making sure that you're kind of mentally in that, in that space. Um, and I would also, I would say lastly, kind of ask for advice uh, in, in my kind of best examples, I think investment is hopefully, or like ecosystem building hopefully is collaborative. And so really thinking through, you know, investors investing together, referring deals to each other, um, joining in angel groups, because it's a great, it's a great kind of opportunity to hear how other people think. And so really not being afraid to raise your hand and say like, well, I, this is my first time ever like evaluating companies, or this is my first time writing a check. C kind of, can I shadow people? Can I understand their process? Can I get a handle on their questions? And my kind of one tiny aside, which I said I was going to make about valuation is it really is an art as much as it is a, as it is a science. And so I would strongly encourage people to understand kind of spend a little time researching what are the different methods for valuation so if you have certain things that you're like oh this makes a lot more sense to me or this is how i would go about doing it so you have more clarity in your mind about how companies are valued and what the met that because there's so many methods out there and so many like there's a lot to behold and so digging a little bit deeper into that so that you're not just taking anything at face value and you have some thoughts and some preferences to contribute as well because that may also be really helpful to the entrepreneur that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Natalia, for all your advice. You also blasted through that and gave us such great gems. So, and it goes by so quick, right? That's why we have like two hours and it's just like, it goes by and the next thing you know, it's four and it's, it's wild. But um, I really also just love the fact that you said to like write things down and like also just kind of make sure you to understand you know, what you're tracking and what matters to you. And at the end of the day, you know, you can, uh, you know, be smart about valuation, be smart about all these things. And then later on in the future, you can look back and say, okay, this is what worked and someone did it. 
And um, make I, mistakes. everyone makes mistakes. You're going to absolutely yes. invest in things. Where you're like, oh my God, like after the fact, be like, what was I thinking? So you're going to make mistakes. It doesn't mean you have bad judgment. It just means you have an opportunity to improve your process and or hone your judgment. So, mm -hmm. you know, you have to keep track of those things. Otherwise you're not learning from them. Exactly. Live and learn. So thank you once again, Natalia. Uh, if you want to put your information in the chat, please do so. If you want people to either contact you, follow you, everyone follow Republic again on Twitter or LinkedIn um, or Instagram, whatever social media you want. Um, and we actually don't have time for a break right now because we're going to go into even more meeting material uh, with Matt Melbourne, who's one of our um, heads of our investment team, actually.